broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. All right, welcome back for another episode of the Freight 360 Podcast. It's our first one of 2024, so Happy New Year, everybody, and uh I apologize. You have to hear my nasally voice today. I'm getting over some kind of whatever the hell's been going around uh, that everyone and their uh, their brother are getting lately. So, but bear with us. We had a great special episode today with a guest. We'll get to him in just a second. Um, if you are brand new or newer to the Freight 360 community, there's over 200 other full length podcast episodes. We've got some Q and A specific episodes. Um, and you can check out our YouTube, our website, and you can check out all kinds of blogs, uh, full length, short length content, everything in between. Um, leave us a question or a comment through YouTube or the website and share us with your other friends and colleagues throughout the industry. And if you'd like to learn more about Freight 360 and our training, go to the Freight360.net website and you can check out the Freight Broker Basics course to learn more about our educational offerings. Um, so without further ado, we've got Ken Adamo from DAT Freight and, a- Freight and Analytics back on with us. Ken, welcome back, man. It's been a hot minute since we had you on the show. How's it going? It's like an annual thing. Thanks for having me. It's like a once <laughs> a year, you know, it's like you go to Olive Garden or you go to Hibachi Steakhouses once a year. You know what I mean? That's it's right. Like, more than That's that, right. you're just wearing out your welcome. <laughs> Well, it's good because we always we try to do um, you know have somebody from DAT come on at various times throughout the year to get a, a different perspective. A lot, of time, especially when it comes to like rates and analytics. Like we had Dean on earlier. We had Tamir um, Dove and their CEO this year. And yeah, we had your CEO and on. We had Tamir Dove Chief Marketing on. Officer. We, had a, we had a whole bunch of DAT reps. Ken's just the one wrapping up the year. I guess kicking off the year for twenty twenty four. So yeah, love to love to have it. Ben, how you doing, man? Doing well. Enjoying uh, a little bit of Christmas break. Awesome. Uh, so, Ken, for those who maybe haven't heard um, of any of our episodes before with you, just give a quick rundown on your role with DAT, what you do there, and that'll give a good context to why we you know, we value your professional opinion here. Yeah, sure. So I'm Chief of Analytics over here at DAT. I've been here a little over four years now. Uh, I joined from FedEx, where I was a customer uh, for quite a while. Uh, I manage and oversee all of our analytics, um, as the title would suggest, our data science, our IQ products, and our industry analysis. Um, and I'm our, I'm our resident tall person as well. So a lot of uh, boxes checked on my job description, but that's my <laughs> that's my general story. I love it. I love it. Um, well, hey, I can't go any further without getting into a little sports banter here. You and Ben are both uh, yinzers, I guess is the correct term, that's right? correct term. Pittsburgh folk, um, there, uh, there's actually a shot that the Steelers make it in the playoffs. Have you seen that? Yeah, they need a couple things to happen. Um, and, yeah, and I believe that would include the Buffalo Bills not making the playoffs. So yeah. it, it's been a wild uh, for the AFC in general. It's been a wild year. No one, I mean, Baltimore's had a pretty good run, but no one really has stuck out as like a super stellar team this year. Like in the past, you'd see like. 13, 14, 15 win teams with like uh, Kansas City or, or some other teams around there. And it's a whole bunch of like nine and sevens, 10 and sixes right now. And the it's going into week 18. We don't know who's going to be in the playoffs yet. It's kind of wild, but you guys have a chance. We'll see yeah. how it pans out. But a lot of pe- parity and poor officiating, truthfully, um, has been, I think, the story of the NFL this year. I yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with you on that one too. There has absolutely been games that were decided off of um, poor officiating. Everyone always says like it's all, it's all about the script, right? The yeah. NFL has they got their script of what they want to see happen, and they're going to do whatever it takes to make that it's, happen. But. I was going to ask two questions about that. One is, do you think that when you've got you know call it like tighter records, like as you pointed out, when you don't have outliers that are you know like fifteen wins, sixteen wins. Do you think the overall viewership of the NFL goes up? Just money spent into the organization overall? I think at the end of the season, it's going to definitely go up. Like you think about literally this Sunday night, the Bills are playing the Dolphins. And that game could be in the Bills or the two seed or the Bills are not in the playoffs at all. That's insane to be the last game of the regular season. But I, I would think, yeah, you probably get more of that. But you also might lose some fan base from like your bandwagoners who are like, oh, my team's only like middle of the road now. And they used to be 
dominating. So I don't know. Because there's a lot of that about the Steelers this year. I mean, it was hard to watch the games, but you couldn't not watch them because they were finding ways to win when you didn't expect them to. And I'm like, it's kind of crazy that attendance is that high. At least it was for most of the season for the Steelers. They were not playing well. (laughs) But for the first time in a long time, you can get not off of directly from the Steelers, but resales, PSLs at Hein or not, Acrisure Stadium or within. I, I think what you get, um, truthfully, is probably a more steady viewership. But people love excellent teams. People love even non the, the college football does better when Georgia or Ohio State or Alabama are tearing it up. Um, in years where you've got kind of, you know, more parity, I don't know that there's as kind of. It was the impetus behind the flex model, right? It was to get the right team. But now, who do you flex? Yeah, that's true. That's a valid oh. point. Yeah, and on, on a college note, we know obviously the uh, championship. I think that's Monday night, right? Coming up, it's going to be um, Washington and the Cheaters. <laughs> Washington. Did you did you see the um, did, did you watch both games on was it Sunday night the the semifinals? What the cotton or the orange? I don't even it know what the whole names the- are anymore. It was the Rose Bowl, and I don't know exactly. It was the I don't know what the other team played at what Washington, what the Washington and Texas played in. Technically, the Cotton Bowl was a high, that Ohio State snoozer against Mizzou. Um, so I don't know yeah, exactly the the the, te- the Longhorns game was crazy because it came down to like a uh, fourth down at the end of the game to literally like they were down by six at like the three yard line, and they just absolutely like screwed it like just fell down didn't get any positive yardage and and that was the game but um probably a lot of uh, a lot of tears being shed in in alabama this past week as well but yeah well hey it is what it is um what else we got going around the the world of sports oh actually ken i do i do want to ask you this because you mentioned the cheaters um is it true because you're obviously uh ohio state fan is it true what I've heard about Michigan when you guys play every year that you guys of are you omit the letter M out of everything? Have you ever heard this? Oh no! I, when I was so I went to grad school at Ohio State, and every street sign, every men's restroom, every letter M is taped over on pretty much the entire city of Columbus. So oh, I'm hilarious. not born. I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh, right? Like right, I right. don't like Michigan. If they weren't cheating, I'd be honestly rooting for them. That, I know I can't believe I'm saying this on camera, but if the, I hate cheaters, right? So like I don't think Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't think the Astros should have a World Series title. Like my general rule, longstanding rule is if you cheat, you shouldn't. Be Belichick and Brady do they fall in that category? Well, too? that's a different one, right? Because even if they nullified all the games they were caught cheating in, they would have still made the playoffs and probably still won. Like. Yeah. Michigan would have vacated even one win this season. They wouldn't have made the playoff, right? So it's a yeah, little that's true. That's true. It's a little different. Um, but yeah, you do, my 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 best friend is born and raised, die hard. He won't say the word Michigan. He calls them ton. The team up north. Team up north. I've heard that one too. Yeah, um, but no <laughs> M's during hate week. Like he'll specific when he's typing a text, he'll put the X emoji every time. There, you know how different how many words have M in it? <laughs> you know, like and he. I mean. Yeah, so you go to you go to Ohio State, and uh, every classroom, every again, how many men's rooms are on campus? They're all got the uh, men's and women's rooms. They all have the M crossed off. That's wild, it's crazy. Um, well, good deal. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how this week pans out, and hopefully uh, next week I'll be talking about the Bills seeding in the playoffs as AFC East champions, and not. Uh, sulking over my team missing the playoffs so we'll see yeah i'm rooting for your bills i don't think that's still i hate this idea of you squeak into the playoffs and get remember the year we just snuck in and got blown out by the chiefs like we fell completely yeah. backwards in yep. it's like what's the point of that i'd rather throw my money behind the bills who can make some noise we'll um, see well i pre- the appreciate that uh that support there ken hey, you it. know i'm a i'm a gregarious supporter of other teams there you go so let's get into, I want to talk a little bit about rates today, but before we get into that, there's been, uh, we talked about it, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks, there's been some chatter on social media, Twitter, well, formerly Twitter, now X, um, in the, uh, the, the freight spaces with discussions about um, freight broker margins, and I know that you were involved somewhat in a lot of the the tweeting, uh, and it all started because you put out a, you basically put out just a, a statement about, hey, I did some research on freight broker margins, and here's what I came up with. Right? Do you have? Can you just give us a little bit of background on how this all started? 
Yeah, I mean, so uh, broker transparency is a real thing, right? And we're not going to go all the way back, but if you go back and do the research, the reason that these transparency regulations exist were originally to protect the broker, right? Because brokers just started um, after deregulation, largely, like they became popular after deregulation as outsourced sales agents for carriers, right? I'm a carrier. I don't have a way to handle a sale, hire a salesperson. I'm going to go to a broker and they're going to sell for me. And as you can imagine, a lot of those agreements were based on commission and to know accurately how much commission I should get as a broker, I needed to know. So if you read the transparency regulations, it basically says all parties to the transaction have a right to know the pertinent financial information. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and we literally, and like, we said this like two weeks ago, I brought this up. This is when we went with TIA and lobbied the last two years about this, the whole CFR 371.3 C or whatever the regulation is about transparency. You're absolutely right. The reason that that regulation was in, was created tw- uh, 40 plus years ago was to protect brokers. And now it's being used almost against brokers in a way that it was never intended to be used. So, but right. th- not to cut you off, but continue. So yeah, that's, that's where this all started. Right. And so some, you know, folks who like to, you know, stir the pot a little bit, um, you know, proclaim there was a raid, right? So, you know, the government and their infinite wisdom, they can't raid any other illegal activity that happens, you know, like the, the, the trash, you know, the, the torn up home down the street from you, they don't raid them, but apparently they were ready to go guns blazing in a TQL's headquarter in Cincinnati, uh, to demand, um, one rate con, right? One. <laughs> and, one. Um, <laughs> and, Look, if they have the right to it, they should get it, right? If you if you want to change the regulations, change the regulations, right? You should comply with the regulations as they're stated, in my opinion. Um, but what I was was trying to push against a little bit was um, uh, selective transparency is really really bad for any industry, right? And I, I used this example with Leffler uh, a couple weeks ago. It's like if you were doing a study on average male height, and the one example you plucked out of the billions of men that exist in this world is Shaquille O'Neal you'd have a pretty skewed version of what average male height looked like. And, you know, when you, so transparency in aggregate, I'm a massive fan of because there's tens, if not hundreds of millions of shipments that flow through brokerages and small carriers every single year. And some of them are going to have really, really high margins. I mean, who on this call has lost money as a freight broker on a particular shipment? It's like, Anyone who's done it, right? Yes. Anyone who's ever shipped anything. (laughs) Yeah. Who's made more than 15% on a shipment, right? We all have. All of us. And we we broke this down, right? But you have to look at the, your, your median at the end of the day on all of us instead of, you know, handpicking whatever best makes your case. Yeah. And I think like, again, you come down to trans selective transparency, isn't transparency. And I would caution that was kind of point one. Point two, there's a lot of carriers that don't have the means to actually study. Like they, even if they aggregated all of their shipments, so your average carrier might be hauling 10 loads a month, 120 loads a year. That wouldn't pass muster as a, as an, as a representative sample of anything, right? Because typically you're going to be constrained to a certain geography or tip, you know different shippers and brokers. So I think it started as a way to bring actual aggregate level transparency that says, look, yeah, there's probably 50,000 shipments a year that move at 40% plus margins, but there's probably 50,000 shipments a year that brokers lose 40% margins on, right? If the if there's a distribution and it looks normal, like a bell curve, like we're all familiar with seeing, then there's probably just as many people losing 40% as there are making 40%. And that's actually pretty much exactly what the data showed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and there's a really- reason for that too, that the way that we're as, as brokers and intermediaries that we're able to give our customers kiss, consistent freight spend throughout the year, they like that. And we're like, yeah, there's some times of the year that we're going to be taking a huge hit, but on the flip side, then there's other times of the year that we're going to be having that, those hits made up for with, with larger, fatter margins. And then in those transition periods, just have an average middle of the bell curve, like you said, Maybe 15, 16, whatever that percentage might be. So, um, so yeah, this, this whole this Twitter even, war, Ben, you're going to add something in here? Yeah. Even furthermore, like there's just even more exaggerated examples of this, I think, to both of your points that people are just unaware of. I think what really fuels most of this, right? It's the anecdotal, it's the story. It's my buddy does this. I talk to him, and this is what they're getting. That can't be right. And I think that's literally what happens, right? And then everybody just starts yelling. But when you get into these large data sets, like I remember when I'd work at TQO, we would look at some of the things like even really big bids against like CH at the time. 
we would look at lanes like how in the world are we getting beat when we're running these at like some of the lanes we would quote on like a big bid might be like five six percent just to get the spot loads that would get us 35 percent. but it's such a blue book services is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce or lumber their online databases contain thousands of companies throughout the produce and lumber industry supply chains you can easily search their databases to generate new sales leads Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help resolve disputed loads. To learn more, go to producebluebook.com or lumberbluebook.com and click join today. Small portion, right? You might be running 30 loads a week that are barely breaking even with your cost. You make like 50, 60 bucks, but on Friday afternoon, you make 10 grand helping this customer, right? Get out of the holes they were in because of what happened in their operations, right? Like, that's the business model. It isn't every load is created equal. And I think that is also another huge misconception just in the industry. Oh, well, this load went from here to there at this many miles. It should be quoted the same as this. And like, there's so many other variables that go into all these two that just don't ever appear in the conversations. And everyone acts like, oh, they're all just the same, right? And I, I just think none of that's true. I have a, just a yeah, really I, hard time. I think what it comes down to, right, is like, it's hard to parse, especially on social media. Like I, LinkedIn was my home for a long time because at least you can have like civil long form discourse there. When you get into like Freight X and I don't even dare tiptoe into Meta, but once you get into Twitter, it was kind of startling because it's kind of hard to parse what's grift and what's general like lack of knowledge, right? So like there's a world where you believe that there's a cabal amongst the largest brokerages to and the largest um, financial sure. statement auditing firms like PricewaterhouseCoopers at a level that would make Enron look like a lemonade stand to falsify financial statements. So there's like a contingent that apparently believes that. And then there's a contingent that believes like, wow, you know, this one customer, this one carrier got a rate con and it was 48%. I mean, it couldn't have been worse luck, right? Because that's what it is, yeah. right? Plucking one. So how many loads does TKL move a year? What, they move like $8 billion worth of freight. I don't, I haven't kept up on their Give or take. transport. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're moving $8 billion worth of freight, which is probably, I don't know, eight to 10 million shipments probably a year, if, if not maybe a little bit more. And the one that got pulled, right, is a allegedly a, a 40% margin, right? It couldn't have been one that they, you know, helped a carrier out, you know, to get back home and they lost 30% on. So it's bad luck for them, right? They, they got the bad end of selective sampling. Um, that would have been, that would have been hilarious. So if you'd never heard well, about it. would have never been reported on by never that. Never heard about it. And you would have never heard about it. Yeah. Um, so, it's um, but it's not well understood. I mean, to, to the point you guys are making, like people get cost per mile. Like DAT has been doing it forever. Um, you've got new companies out there that are trying to do it. Um, you know, Freight Waves has, has, has been reporting on it. Like people understand generally, and they've got a level of comfort around. They might not like it during these markets. They like it during twenty twenty one. Oh yeah, um, but this whole concept of the gross margin isn't super well understood. Um, and it's why it's caused me like it's good muscle to build, right? If you're head of analytics at a, for, at a data company, it's kind of good muscle to to keep to keep working to help make that understood. Because if I can't explain it to the lowest common denominator, um, then I probably need to do a better job of explaining it. So point. let's look at. Um, I, I want to start off with I'm good on the Twitter discussion, unless you guys want to hop back into that at all. But I, I wanted it to to kind of get into. The market overall, because you you mentioned 2021 a minute ago, um, and you're right. Everybody, you know, trucking companies were probably making fat margins in 2021 compared to how they are now. Even if they had inflated prices on truck notes and whatnot, um, for over you know overpaying for a truck, things like that. But if you look at about uh, 18 months ago or so, we saw the spot and contract markets flip. Uh, and Ben, we've been kind of tracking it since like last, what, March or April, where all when of a sudden happen, Ken? spot rates got cheaper than contract rates. And I'm curious, Ken, do you know when, I'm sure you do, when did they invert? And the other question I have is, I think it happened prior to the pandemic, but it maybe happened once. Has it ever happened? And when did it happen for the recent memory? Where the Oh, yeah, it happened right. It happened commensurate with the Ukraine invasion, like same month. I think it was March of like March. 22. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. So it happened last, right after the p summer peak of 18. We all remember what that was like, right? Like right after summer peaked and then things started to really, really cool back down. 
Um, if you went back even further, you'd go back to like right around the turn of the year of 2015. Um, right after that, you kind of got into that industrial recession type period that predated the ELD driven upcycle. Um, so it's like that's the pit of your stomach going over the hill of a roller coaster that happens at the end of every freight cycle. But, it, but so, it, it's unusual for it to last this long, is it not? Um, well, it's un- it's unusual for it to also last as long as it did in the other direction. Okay, right? yeah, so that's that's fair. Yeah. So you know, it's we use the term overbought and oversold a lot internally, but it's to the extent that the market became way overbought on the high side, it's we're feeling the effects of it being oversold, if you want to just kind of torture that uh, vernacular um, on the downside. So, you know, fuel spiked when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, kind of one, two punch of that in the market softening. And we've been on this, this wild ride since. Um, But yeah. So, okay. So that, that makes sense. I, I, I guess I didn't put it into perspective of, I always would have thought, cause Ben, you and I would talk about, we're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's the spot market's cheaper right now. This is a great time to go out there and, and try to, you know, prospect business and go at it from that angle where you can you can literally get a truck for cheaper than what these folks are contracted on. And we're like, it's not going to last for long. And then we fast forward. And we're like, it lasted throughout the the entire rest of 2022 and then all of 2023. Well, and here's now the other here piece. we are in 24. Ben, right. go and ahead. The, just, I was just going to say at the beginning of that, right? The other thing too, I think that happened was, right? Like shippers were terrified. They literally couldn't get trucks to move their goods to meet their sales numbers, right? So they were going back to their carriers and going, listen, we'll pay you more, guarantee us capacity this year. And I think that also helped push the contract market farther away from the spot market was just recency bias of just fear that they couldn't get the capacity when they needed it. They had problems getting inventory and then you have problems getting a truck. So it's like, well, if you can't buy the products you need to sell and you can't ship it, you don't have a business. I think that also contributed to it. Or do you think that was far less impactful into why they split in the first place? No, I think that was part of it. I think the other thing too, you got to realize, and I know that you both do, but we don't always think about it is almost every contract load has a fuel surcharge or fuel recapture program. So the main event that at least kicked off the tumbling of the spot market actually probably resulted in increased profitability of contract carry. Most contract carriers, if they're running more, well, let me say it this way. Any contract carrier that's running more efficient than your average fuel surcharge program is at least um, the, the fuel surcharge program is accretive to their bottom line. <laughs> that's probably the most politically way to say it, good, politically correct way to say it. So, you know, it, the big orange trucks driving down the street weren't sweating the increased fuel prices because their fuel surcharge float, you know, floats along top the market and they're also hedging fuel um, on the backside. So I think it's a lot of different factors, but wholesale across the board, contract immediately became the more advantageous place to be for everyone involved, frankly. Like all of a yeah. sudden and all at once. And the small carriers without the relationships weren't even at the table. And then they just got farther no. and farther from the table because they didn't have the resources. Like you pointed out, they don't have sales teams. They don't have the ability to go and start establishing them. And I feel like that also contributed to them getting farther and farther. Yeah. And I will say, like, if you want to look at another reason why it's going to most likely be a more prolonged downturn than prior times, it's because they built up such a bank, right? They, they, you had publicly traded trucking firms running 68, 67% ORs, right? That's like a four minute mile. Like it's unheard of um, for those kind of profitability. You, so is that, a, so I, I'm curious, is that one of the things that you track at your level is the profitability of, of publicly traded companies like that? Or oh, is that yeah. just a, ran- a random stat that you're, you're pulling out? Oh no, we look, we look at all of that. Right. Um, and the, you know, it's also like old dominion always runs a more profitable LTL firm than yellow did. Right. Um, so we, we're looking at all of that to say, um, as a proxy, cause there are still a lot of really large private trucking companies that we can't peek into their financials. Sure. Right. Um, so just like we look at CH Robinson and RXO and coyote and, uh, Uber freight to proxy what, Echo might be doing, right? Because Echo went private, Jordan Company bought them. We do the same thing on the trucking side. I will say it's a lot easier on the brokerage side because not everyone operates differently, right? Uh, Old Dominion's operational and pricing excellence sets them aside from, you know, you name it, Arc Best or, or anyone else. Okay, so the takeaway on what really your, your point is, you're saying they were able to run so fat for years, which affords them the ability to run thin now to try and weather this. Is that the takeaway? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. That's a hundred percent. And that's not even okay. the big, so any carrier that wasn't like running through Vegas after they delivered like a month's worth of great freight was able to, um, ride this longer than expected, frankly. Right. And I want to, I want to reiterate to everybody because we've talked about that a lot and it's something simple, but it's profound, right? The companies that when things were going well, saved more money, had more money saved for when things aren't going well. So they didn't have to make as many poor decisions. Right. And yeah. it's simple, but it's not easy to do. Right. Because I think when you're in the market, even myself included, when you're in a hot market, it kind of feels like it'll last forever, right? To get a little bit looser with what you're, hey, let's fix this truck up. Hey, we've wanted to add to this. We wanted to add to staff if you're a brokerage. This happens in every business, right? The point is to what you, I think you said, and I think is really worth understanding for everybody is you've got to be able to weather the shitty storms when it's good times. And if you're not putting money away, it's inevitable, right? The market always cycles. It goes up and down and up again, right? It never stays in one side or the other. And I think a lot of personal responsibility should fall under this. And most people just never look at this. Well, I also yeah. think too, before Ken says that, think about the average like tenure of someone in transportation because of all the new entrants that came in and 2020 and 2021 they didn't have like hindsight or like previous knowledge or did they care to like even think to do research to be able to project it like oh this doesn't last forever you know what i mean so that that's just as an aside my take on it no it's an extremely high turnover industry too right your average freight broker is a kid right out of college with a division one school that uh sees the ability to earn six figures their first year if, once they go off stipend right so like yeah you know turnover is high the point i was going to make it's a it's an unfortunate truth, but it's a truth worth understanding. The market, because the question we get all the time, especially from small carriers, and it's kind of a heartbreaking question, is how can the market as a whole go below the cost to operate a truck? It doesn't seem fair. And the unfortunate answer there is in a very short term, maybe a couple of months, maybe a quarter or two, is that the market will go to the variable cost to operate a truck. And unfortunately, there's a lot of uneven and unexpected fixed costs that pop up. And that's why you see kind of up and down attrition. What I mean break by that, that? Break that down Barney style for anybody yeah. that's like fairly newer that's to the really good point. And that. So if I'm a truck driver and my total cost to run my truck right now is a buck ninety, right? That's all in. That's paying myself. That's setting aside money for when I need new tires and and, and brakes and engine rebuild. I'm probably only, my only direct expenses are my monthly truck payment, my fuel, uh, my, insurance. I'm doing monthly, yeah, anything insurance. Like, so that's my only truly variable cost. And maybe let's say that's at a buck 60 or a buck 65. So you'll continue running because on a, the miles I ran today, like on an odometer basis, I'm making or breaking even on that, but I'm not paying myself. And, you know, God forbid, if I blow a head gasket, I'm assuming diesel engines have head gaskets, but just go with me here. If I blow a head gasket and I go pull into the mechanic, what do I do? Park the truck, contact the leasing company or contact the finance company and say, I'm out of money. And that's why when you look at the FMCSA uh, authority revocations, it's lumpier than you would expect because when does it get lumpy? Quarterly insurance payments, if that's the plan you're on. Um, maintenance license cycles. License plates. License Renewals. and annual registration. UCRs. So over the long arc of time, it's absolutely true that the market won't go below the long-term cost to operate a trucking company. That's 100% true. But it's a very short-term market, right? What happens whenever the cost of oil dips below the cost to produce? They shut the wells off. Yeah. But that doesn't happen in trucking, right? They actually dip down below um, the variable, you know, to the variable cost and even sometimes below, right? Because if you've got... 10, 15 grand in the bank and you can afford to lose a little money on fuel for a, few, a month or two, you might do that until you're officially out of money, right? And how, how long do you think that period can last before it's not sustainable? It can't be more than a couple quarters, right? Because at that point, you're turning over like- Even how that long? feels so long to me. Like well, they've got a savings quarters. built up, right? That's exactly what goes back to the other point is they've, got, they've built up some savings um, and fuel has come down, right? So their 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 cost to operate has edged down in the tail half of last year as fuels come back down to earth. So, you know, we we look at that as optimistic, but then how often do you look at it as like prolonging the inevitable? Because what what actually needs to happen? And then again, this sounds cruel, but what needs to happen is enough capacity needs to exit the market, 
to rebalance supply and demand to start rates back up. It's just a fundamental truth. Yes. And don't you think that part of that company is operating below that variable level is what's going to force certain small carriers to exit, right? Yep. That's how we get like a capacity crunch every time, right? Because yeah. all of a, a sudden and all at once. Natural correction, exactly. Yep. All of a sudden and all at once. And again, I think it's an admirable quality with truck drivers that they run till the very end. Like how many truck drivers or small owner operators do you know? They're like, you know, the next couple quarters doesn't look real great. I'm going to sell my truck and get into something else. They're like, I'll be damned if I'm not going to keep turning these wheels until I can't turn them anymore. And again, yeah. that's the admirable quality we all love about the American truck driver. But at the end of the day, it leads us to a point where the correction necessarily becomes violent. So where are we, in your opinion, no one's got a crystal ball, but where are we in that process right now? We're starting off the year. It's the first week of January. Have we? Are we at that soft bottom now, per se, or in that variable level now, or do we still have further to go? Because Ben and I, I don't think argued, rates are going to go we, down. We have, we've made the argument, or I have at least, that I, I think that we've already hit what you could call the soft bottom, but you're the, you're the tired of struggling to find accurate rates and the right cares for your freight with DAT one. You can access more than 500 million posted loads and trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24 seven. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the country. You'll get real-time rates on every lane so you know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you commit to it. Plus, you get instant access to top bids from qualified carriers around the country. Get 10% off your first year of DAT1 when you visit the link in the show notes. The expert, not me. So I'm curious. Yeah, I think we're off bottom, to be frank with you. Like adjusted for fuel. You have to adjust for you know fuel prices. I think adjusted for fuel, we're at, if not a little bit up from bottom. Okay. And that's exactly what I, we said a couple weeks ago, yeah. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we've yet cleared that all-in cost to operate, which means annual titling, annual inspections, all of those things that happen. And then, you know, the annual freight slowdown. You know, you guys have all been in this industry quite a while. February is a really, really slow month for freight. Like, really, really slow, especially on the asset side. Um, so I think, well, whether that, and then as we pick up this spring, we sh- we should handle the, the spring shipping peak. This is going to be a controversial statement. So I think we'll handle the spring shipping season at a bit of a capacity deficit for the first time since the market turned down. Question. I like Do that. You, does Is that at all contingent on what happens with the supply of freight in the market and what the Fed's going to do? I are think, you, yeah. Are you factoring I'm not expecting- it into that side of it? I'm not, I'm actually factoring even. I'm not factoring. E- so an election year is typically a, a malaisical year for freight. Like th- things don't, people aren't placing bets. They're not typically c- starting construction on massive warehouses in an election year. That doesn't, it, it is typically a little bit uh, bearish. So if you couple an election year with a couple modest rate decreases, and let's just say demand stays flat ish. Um, so you have macro demand and then you have freight demand. I do think depleted inventories through peak will offer some tailwind heading into the spring, which is going to be good. This was the big thing I cautioned against. Um, and I'm not, again, like a typical, I, I wouldn't be what you would call like an alarmist. But the one thing that I was really worried about was a lot of people ran with a, a, a random clipping here and there that Walmart was done with restocking. The restocking was done. Everything that was going to be on the shelf for Christmas needed to be shipped. And that just proved wholesale to not be true. You had record uh, Black Friday and uh Christmas e-commerce and brick and mortar commerce, and yet not record shipping. What's that tell you? There was a bunch of crap in the warehouse. Yeah, yeah. Um, so again, I'm sure someone in the supply chain department passed a note onto investor relations and said, "Say this at the investor call," and that's what got said. But in reality, what happened was there's still a lot of inventory out there floating around. Um, so I think that has been depleted now. I think it's very expensive to carry inventory which on a real-time basis is good for freight because you'll see a little bit more just in time, right? High interest rates means it's more expensive to carry the inventory. Um, so I think this spring will be a trend. To, so don't expect like, oh, wow, it's crazy this spring. I just think that'll start to feel some pressure. But then H2 of next year, I think, is when we'll start to see more actual recovery. Things is that there, we're familiar with. Is there, um, and excluding a global pandemic, is there a uh, massive event 
that you could see in 2024 that could accelerate that process? We're already, there's already multiple wars going around around the world. Um, could speed limiters do it, right? I mean, so what was the big deal oh, with yeah, ELDs? That's a good point. So yeah. if it was ELDs and that reduced just, what, a couple hundred basis points worth of capacity, right? Because it took away the, the bumper hours that you could fudge with logs. If speed limiters became a real serious thing um, in the next year. Is that year, on the docket for 2024? Or is that still it, like they're taking a can on it? Yeah. Unless, again, it's an election year, man. Like, I think, would you be surprised at all if polls were trending? And again, this is an apolitical statement. I'm not telling you this is a no endorsement of either party. If polls were trending red, would you be surprised at all if uh, federal marijuana legalization became all of a sudden on the on the table before the election? I wouldn't be. Right? So, like, there's a lot of levers, and, and Buttigieg has been pretty quiet as it – like, I know a lot of people don't like him for a lot of different reasons – but in terms of like policy, I don't know that he's been as active as he could have been. Um, but we'll see. Interesting. I think mainly you're going to look at demand pressures as a result of interest rates and levels of investment. Like, do new do, do, if if, um, if 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 lending rates for a thirty year mortgage go below five percent, nice little tailwind. Not crazy. Nice little tailwind. Why? Because people start moving. Who's moving today? Like you're comfortable Nobody. in your house. You're at a two point nine percent interest rate. Why would you ever move? The housing market's crushed right now because of the inverted relationship. The only counter argument I would make, I think, to everything you said, Ken, is that I think for the same reason that you were talking about overbuying to being oversold in the carrier market, I think we're seeing that play out in the economic market. And I think it's still that wave is kind of dwarfing what would be traditionally more macroeconomic things. I do think that is true. And I think you always tend to see that. I still think there's a lot that's going to play out. So like you pointed out about inventory, what did the end of the year look like too? Because I know I was watching the rates coming up into Christmas and it seemed like they stopped spiking about a week or so before the end of the year, but I didn't see Shipping them rates? up to the end of the year. Yeah. Did they play out they the rest right of the about way? where you'd expect? They normally yeah, did. Right about, I did a little poll on social media, like a buck 75 is where we, a lot of people thought they were going to settle. And that's about yeah. where they settled. Um, you know, it, but that's more of like an out of service kind of deal, right? Where like you're just you're shrinking. There's not a ton of stuff that needs shipped on December 30th, right? It's more of like no. a, who's there to haul it. Yeah, uh, you're right though about macro. I, I, demand is the bigger hammer, right? If you look at supply and demand, we're still think, buying services. We overbought services to the point where we saw the economy still do very well, and it kind of nobody believed it should. And we spent more money, but we didn't buy as many goods because we still had the hangover from services from the pandemic. At least that's reported right like more yeah. more increase in spending to travel people didn't travel for so long more vacations none of that stuff ships in a truck i think though consumer budgets are down and we have no idea where they'll be next year but to your the point of the overall economy if people just start buying more stuff again for whatever reason and i think interest rates fuel that in some way i think you see that maybe move in our favor I, I don't know. Maybe it's hopeful or wishful thinking that I'm just really hopeful that like it spurs the economy in enough that we get a bit more of an uptick when the market does shift. But I don't know. It's always hard to tell, right? What would you say? Proportionately, if you're talking about the amount of freight versus the amount of carries in the market, what would you weight as the larger impact? Oh, so I don't know. Like, it's hard to think about gross numbers, right? Because ultimately, they're met, right? Ultimately, the amount of freight that needs move, like freight moves. Yes, move. It's one of the yes, first things right. we're taught in the industry. Right? But I, I do think that like demand effects cast a heavier impact on the market than supply. It, at like a macro level. Like, look, when there's a hurricane and there's no trucks. There's a natural disaster. That's yeah. The first yeah. Thing is, yes. yeah. So yep. like on a, on a regional scale, a bridge goes down in North Atlanta or whatever, uh, uh, you know, on the perimeter, like that, that's different. I think on the, on the high level scale, if the economy is doing really, really well and we have too many trucks, the market will outrun that, right? The, the, the market will still run hot. Yeah. If, you know, if the, if the demand, if we, if we reach equilibrium on the number of trucks coming out of this down cycle and the economy totally craps the bed next year for some reason, right? Let's just say our credit rating gets down. I have no idea what that would be, but let's just say yeah. something bad happens in the economy. Um, there's no amount, like, we'll, we'll have to probably lose another 10,000 trucks to make up for that. Um, cause the problem is, and the reason that happens is cause whether we're saying it overtly or not, we're talking about the spot market and you've got this massive ballast or counterweight, which is the 90% of freight that moves on contract and private and dedicated. Mm -hmm. And 
1% changes in those acceptance rates have massive changes downstream. And I think right now, um, what we don't know is how much capacity, driver capacity I'm talking about now, shifted to private and dedicated through the pandemic um, and won't come back. Because if you go work construction when trucking gets really, really bad and then it gets really, really good again, you can come back. Come back. Yeah. If you go get you, if you've got two nice clean press uniforms to go drive for Dollar General in your home every night and you're driving in a nice new truck, you're not coming back. And Dollar General and all these other firms have introduced have increased their private fleets yeah. by 10, 15, 20%. And that's big. Um let me ask you Do you guys that. track you had you were talking about acceptance rates. Do you guys track um tender rejections through DAT? Um, say more. Okay. Uh, like, so contracted, um, lanes for asset based carriers. Do you guys track the amount of like, the, and, you know, freight waves, right? They're going to have a tender rejection index that says, Hey, you know, 6% of tenders are being rejected from contracted lanes where it was like upwards of 30% in the peak of the pandemic. It was, you know, 10% as a baseline three years before that. Do you got, cause I know you track a lot of the rates. Do you track anything as far as the amount of freight Contract that, accepted contracted that gets rejected. basically not accepted by that, by that carrier or no? No. So we don't, that okay. is not a data set that we work with. So I would tell you a couple of things like, because that'll, that'll impact, like you said, that'll have downstream impacts on the spot market. I was just curious if there's any sort of data set that DAT track, but no worries. We're no, just- so like I, the one I'll say about is 2023 Ken may have had a quip about freight waves in there, but I'm 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 better this year. Uh, I've got a resolution. Um, I'll say I think the tender rejection data is good, and I will tell you that the market happens so fast that when we look at load to truck data and the spot rating data. It's not like that tender gets rejected today and then it appears in a different data set tomorrow. Once that tender gets rejected through the routing guide, where does it go? Spot. It either sits. Spot over here. Yeah. It either sits or it went to the spot market. And once it comes to the spot market, we see it. So I think maybe you're getting uh, an extra hour of latency. May- and again, I don't even know if Freightways data updates intraday. My guess is if you're looking at just a daily, if I look at yesterday's outbound tender. Every 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. So if. I can say this pretty confidently then, I think. Um, that's a statement. But if you look at yesterday's outbound tender <laughs> rejection index and our outbound today's. load to truck ratio for a specific market or even today, you same thing. You're going to see it. It might not be exact. There might be certain markets and certain commodities that, and again, Lord help me for saying this, there might be certain areas. Like if you're moving retail out of Harrisburg, I, I'm just picking something totally at random. I have no knowledge of this. The, the, the outbound tender data might be better for you. If you're moving FAK out of Houston, Load to truck ratio might be better for you. But my guess is when you even out the puts and takes, both are going to have probably generally a similar story to tell. Okay. So I have a question. And they both lead rates by a couple days, right? So if you have elevated rejection rates in a market or elevated load to truck ratios in a market for more than a day or two, you're going to see rates start to creep up. The correlation is like 75%. Um, so I have a question. For my data anyway. One of the things that I've seen a lot this year, and this is definitely anecdotal, that's why I really was looking forward to your take on this, is on a lot of the bids that I've seen and a lot of the bids that I've gone through with some of our clients or that they've just referenced, right? And again, anecdotal, but stories of like, you know, large major shippers, right? And they're going through bids. And I've seen this too, where it's like, it looks like 40% of the lanes, like you just absolutely couldn't cover just way below market rates. And then a few of the shippers that I've talked to, right, just in conversation throughout the year have told me like, yeah, we're absolutely doing this on purpose. We are pushing rates as far down as we can to get as much back as we lost in the previous years. We're going to push them as far as we can. What I'm hearing from the brokers and the other people in the market are, you know, Historically, that would have created paper rates. You're, you know, you're securing capacity at rates that nobody's ever going to actually pick that load up for, right? The question I've had and that I kind of felt like was happening was it seems like the shippers, and again, it's economics, they are going to pay the least amount they can at some level of service to maintain that. Are they overplaying their hand? Are they pushing it farther than they normally do? And if that's true, I feel like that could create a much harder bullwhip on the other side of the market. If you have all these large shippers with large portions of rates and the spot market moves at all and the opportunity cost is I'm not going to pick up this contracted load, can't you see like a massive shift back to the spot market where you're going to see that happen much faster? Or 
do you think the shippers are not able to have as much influence individually into those things? So I think it's important to take our advice that we started the show, which as much as we laughed about our friend, um, wherever they live. Um, yeah. I think there are certainly some shippers doing that, right? Cause especially the ones where the person is still in the seat who was totally torched in 2021 and 2022, I'm sure they're yeah. out for blood. I think what other people like, at a macro level, we talked to a lot of shippers. We had our annual conference in Houston in October and got to speak with about 100 shippers. I'd say like at least half of them. And again, these are big enterprise that you know know us and come to our show. Probably like half of them were new enroll in the last 12 to 18 months. So like you could be buying toilet paper or stationery one day and then get put on the freight procurement side. And yeah. there, right? Like shippers, yep. good shippers don't do that, but not every shipper is a good shipper. So let's just kind of level set and say – that's part of it. You see a massive outsourcing of bids too. So there's a huge tranche of the market that gets outsourced either to small private consultancies or the big ones like TMC or now Uber Freight, you know, the old Transplace uh, bid management. Um, and now you're seeing tech players like LoadSmart and Emerge come in that I almost said you're seeing Emerge emerge, but um, good branding. Uh, you're, so I you think you're seeing a, a fragmentation of how shippers go to bid is the long and short of what I'm trying to say here. And are some of them out for blood? Sure. I think a lot of them are realizing they cannot damage their carrier relationships and dip their toe in the spot. We're seeing voluntary spot market participation up in a way that we haven't seen before. It's not huge, but it typically doesn't happen. That's normally like an old wives tale, to be truthful with you. Like for a shipper to dip their toe deliberately into the spot market just to save money doesn't happen a lot. And they over the last- Well, it's usually not a money saver on the whole, right? right? Yeah, but for the last year to the point, you know, bringing this whole thing full circle- they can get some of that savings doing it that way. Um, I don't, if anything, I'll leave you with this one point. We are seeing them move back to longer bid cycles. Remember all of the talk, the mini bid is here to stay. Yeah, we all had, have shirts, yeah. mini bid for life. You know, everyone's about the mini bid. And you know what? All of the big, big box retailers, all of the big CPG firms are saying now, 12 month bids back, baby. I was going to say, that's something consuming. that I noticed at the end of 23, like October, when bid season started to open up for 2024, it was the first time in like two years that I saw annual bids going through. And I'm like, it's been a long time since we've had to project rates out 12 months. Um, but that's a good sign, I think. Yeah, I remember during the peak of the madness, I'll, I think I'll remember this as long as I've been in the industry. I was dealing with a tuna supplier. And this woman was telling the crowd that um, – she was running bi-weekly bids, and she staggered them so that every week they had a bid. They ran their, their – all of the inbound was refrigerated because it was raw tuna, and all of the outbound was shelf-stable. So she was running her inbound refrigerated bid one week for two weeks, and then the next week would run the outbound shelf-stable for the canned and uh, foil pack tuna. So imagine running a bid every week for a year. <laughs> it's got to be insanity. That's insane. Like, I can't – So back to like, well, yeah, you know – and then you talk to some of these big box retailers and they, you know, they have eight people working for them and each eight manage a billion each of logistics spend. And that's just like wild to me, you know, like that's a scale that none of us really, I think I have an appreciation yeah. for. That's a huge yeah. number. Wow. Well, uh, I guess if, I guess to kind of put a, a bow on this conversation, what, um, what would you say is a key takeaway from 2023? And and then uh, to piggyback off of that, what would you give as advice to anybody in the industry moving forward this year? I think it's an awful cliche, but it's true. And that history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And, you know, we cautioned that the worst thing that could probably happen in 2023 at the start of the year was it looked exactly like 2019. 2019 was my last year in the industry and it sucked. It was worse than 15. Because it just didn't move. It's it, it, it got to bottom quick and it sat there. And that's what that year felt like to me. Um, I think it's a story of resiliency, though. I think it's a story of um, Chris Jolly, the freight coach, says this a lot. You can make money in any market. It's something I just completely wholesale agree. Uh, especially the brokerage um, community is, is fortunate enough to have variable control over their expenses and revenues. Um, and some of those relationships can certainly last market cycles. Looking at 4 to 24... It's the same advice, right? We dug out of 19. Uh, we dug out of the 15, 16, uh, which was really, really rough, especially if you were in the Midwest hauling for the automakers. The tier ones just got absolutely beat over the head, if you remember that cycle. Um, but it comes back, and it has every couple of years, it cycles since deregulation up and down. Um, the one thing I'll kind of close on, um, 
we're now stretching to the somewhat long timers, right? You may not have just entered the industry, but all you saw was 18 and 21, right? They're not all like that, right? I was there for the three cycles prior to that, and they were much, much more muted, right? You didn't, it was a cruise ship, not a dinghy, right? Like the market yeah. was up, 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 up. You turned around, and you're like, oh, crap, rates are up 20% over the last year and a half. Like, what the heck happened? Not rates are up 80% over the last 12 months. So if you're maybe a three to five year level of experience in this market, understand that it might not be like it was during 18, 17, 18 and 21, 22. Um, but certainly good times are here to come again. It's just timing them and taking advantage of them. That's a really good point. Um, and Ben, you and I have talked about this before. There's, there's a lot of people that listen to this show that didn't know a pre COVID freight market. So they didn't understand why is the market today the way that it is when it just two years ago, it was, you know, red hot. And Ken, you make a good point because if you look back in that hindsight, if you go back 10, 15 years, we've seen this cycle over and over and over. And I, I do think that it was uh, an exaggerated, um, I don't I shouldn't say was, it is, it is this, this, cycle right now is an exaggerated. It was very long with its um, red hotness and it's been very long with its contracted side of like, kind of the, the, the whiplash effect. So, and I, I like remember it. in 18, Nate, I'll tell you, like I was sitting there, I was running a pricing department at FedEx. We had the asset and the non-asset division and I won't out the name of the company, but we priced it. We were declined to price it. It came back. We declined to price it. It came back. We declined to price it. It came back. And they said, look, folks, it was a project. I don't care what you write on this check, but I'm sending you a blank. If, you know, I'm sending you a blank check. I want you to haul this freight. And I, I don't think this is getting too specific. It was for a monster truck um, tour, monster jam tour, and successfully executed on the project. And out, everyone who was in the industry at that time knows that your annual sales conference that next year was absolutely bonkers. Like we rented oh, out stream, yeah. so, stream song in Florida, like rented out the whole clubhouse. And in and, uh, and the hand to God truth, there was a monster truck out front of the Stream Song Clubhouse when we rented it out this year because they were so thankful. I would never have thought I'd see a market like that again. Yeah. Three years later, you I, did. Why don't you say that? Because I remember <laughs> we had the brokerage I worked for before the one I'm at now. Obviously, 2018 was great. We had a Key West trip for the sales team that next February. So then the boss was um, well, I, the owner of the company who wasn't very embedded with logistics or transportation. He just owned the company. Um, he's like, if you could do it last year, we could do it again this year. So he set like loftier goals. And he's like, we're going to send you guys to Italy next year. If you hit the goals this time, and we're like, it's just not possible. Like what just happened was a wild year. It can happen again, but it's not going to happen this year. So, oh, so FedEx ran on fiscal years, June to May. Okay. So think about for how good 18 was, if you captured that, how bad 19 would have been going from yep. June of 18 to May. So we went from being in Stream Song in Florida to the Embassy Suites off of Canton Road in Ohio. <laughs> That's That encompasses the freight market, my friend. The Embassy Suites where they give you a free breakfast and a free happy hour included in it. So. Yeah, one free drink ticket. Yep, yep. <laughs> Yeah. Well, hey, I think the takeaway is, um, and I, I don't want to skip this part. You mentioned Chris Jolly, the freight coach. You can make money on your market. Um, agreed. And Ben and I talk about this a lot. There's a different approach and a different need that customers have. And customers' problems change, whether it's price sensitivity or just the ab ability to secure truck uh, for a shipment. There's always an opportunity just about the way you approach it. So I think just to be cognizant that we're not going to be living in a steady freight market. Uh, it might seem like it's been steady, but a low study the last 12 months, but it will change. It will go up and it will come back down again. And it's going to rinse and repeat. Like you said, history rhymes. I like that. I've never heard that one. It's pretty good, but that's a, it's a good way to look at it. So Ken, we appreciate having you on. You got anything uh, else you want to share with the audience before we wrap it up here? No, uh, like I said, I uh, wrapping up a longer form white paper on the broker margin stuff. I'll be sharing that on LinkedIn. Uh, it's just under my name, Ken Adamo, and I'm the freight nerd on Twitter. Um, so if you want to, that's usually shorter form analytics and memes. So um, engage with me there, and I'm happy to answer I, any questions. Or... I gotta say, I do like I do like your uh, Twitter presence. We'll make sure we put a a uh, link 
to your, we'll do your LinkedIn as well as your Twitter handle and the show notes. So make sure everyone follows Ken Adamo on there. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, our pleasure. Ben, you got anything you want to add in for Ken before we put a lid on it? I don't. I think there were a lot of really good takeaways. I think the most important is the market cycles. It's a circle. Wherever it is now, it'll be again. And where it isn't, it'll be there soon enough, right? And as long as you do the right things, you ask the right questions, if you have a competitive advantage of understanding and trying to understand the needs of your customer, you can make money whether the market goes up, down, or stays the same, right? It's seven to $800 billion. No company out there is trying to grab the entire market share. You need to do a very small percentage of that to be very successful. There's plenty of business out there, no matter where you're at in the market, for sure. Definitely. Well, Ken, hopefully we get you on uh, before next January. I'm in. (laughs) All right. Sounds good. Ben, final thoughts? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. If you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week. 